Say, right lights. Say <laughs> lights are on. That means it's go. All righty. Um, hello, everybody. I hope you're doing absolutely brilliantly. Um, thank you so much for coming. Um, I'm your friendly host. I'm Gareth Mitchell, and I'm one of the lecturers in the Science Communication Unit next door at Imperial College. So it's a long way of saying, in my day job, I teach scientists how to communicate. And in return, they teach me a lot of science, so it's very <laughs> reciprocal. And, um, and I also broadcast. So I'm at the BBC as one of their uh, science radio presenters. So I have a weekly technology program on the BBC World Service. So, um, so I'm not really used to seeing my audience, really. I'm usually on the radio. <laughs> We're usually doing this kind of thing in a studio or yeah. on Zoom. But uh, here we are, all together, on stage, with me and you, the audience. So... Um, the topic today, as you'll know from your programme and why you're here, is, is eco-anxiety. And it's something we're all very aware of, isn't it? That we see so many distress, distressing images and videos and news footage from regions of the world. Obviously, Germany springs to mind earlier in the summer. We, we've had a fair bit of um, flooding here in the UK, flash floods. Just When was it? The other day I was coming into work, we'd had flash floods in, yeah. in Knightsbridge. It was stunning, yeah. you know, just uh, outside Harrods, it was like a river. Um, so we're very aware of those kinds of events going on, and I've been very developed world-centric there, but as, as uh, I'm afraid, we're, we're all aware, um, those who bear the biggest brunt are those in the low and uh, lower middle, uh, lower income countries, and that rather grim irony, paradox, call it what you will, that much of the damage that the so-called developed world has inflicted is actually borne by um, uh, low-income countries and their people. So this is very, very distressing. And if there is a positive, then eco-anxiety is now a thing, and I don't mean that glibly or flippantly, but as a, a viable... Um, research area and an area of study, as we'll hear from our panel tonight. So, uh, tonight, I've, I've, I've been here all day, you see. It's a bit like Vegas. So I don't know if it's night or day. Is, is it sunny outside? How is it? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I'm all the more grateful for you being here, by the way, given that it's so sunny outside. Um, so that sets the, the scene for today. Uh, now, of course, we have our wonderful audience here in the theatre, but uh, at home, we have you as well, watching online, which is great. So we're going hybrid. Check us out. Living in the future. It's like being in a William Gibson novel or something like that. Um, so just a few things to go through before I uh, introduce the panel. Uh, for those of you here in the um, theatre audience, uh, we are asking you to keep your face coverings on, and I see most of you are. And you might be thinking, well, he's not wearing his. Neither are the panel. What's going on? Well, um, we, we are within the COVID uh, restrictions doing this. We thought quite deeply about whether it should be masks on or off for the panel. We think, obviously, we can communicate better with them off. There's a safe distance between us and you. Um, even the audience microphone is obviously more than two metres away, and we're not facing looking at each other directly. And I assure you, we've had them on in the green room, and we'll put them back on again when we go back to the green room after this. So just explaining that we're, we're staying within the rules, and we're really grateful for you abiding by them as well. Um, so, and, and really, just a little bit about our One World series here. It's all part of the Great Exhibition Road Festival, so it's not just happening today. We have a whole series of events, um, talks, demos. They're doing, they're doing leaf printing next door at Imperial mm -hmm. College in the reception area of Imperial. Oh. How cool is that Lovely. leaf printing going on at yeah. our university? I wish they did that every day. Yeah. So there's just a whole range of, of things going on, and we really want you to be part of it and to continue to support it. And that really makes the case for us doing this every year and, and keeping it going. So all the events uh, are online, the great exhibition road festival.co.uk. Um, so let me um, crack straight on and just uh, introduce those of you, those of, um, our, those of us, those of you, those of everybody who are here on our panel. That was slick, wasn't it? Um, let's uh, meet, first of all, Dr. Emma Lawrence, who's um, a Mental Health Innovations Fellow at the Institute of Global Health Innovation um, and um, also studied science communication back in the day. But that's you, actually, Lottie. Did you study science communication as well, Emma? Uh, um, as a graduate degree. Ah, oh, you did. I'm yeah. an, mostly... A, 
a physicist, chemist, and then neuroscientist, but in between, no science communicator for a while. Cool. Oh, God, I'm glad I got that right, because I, I knew that, that we'll find out about Lottie. She studied science communication. I thought, yeah. did I write that in the wrong <laughs> column? That's good. Right. Thanks for reassuring me. Um, so, Emma, just to get us started then, um, eco-anxiety, how can we deal with it? Just a few quick words on, do you have any way of processing it, of coping with it? Mm. Yeah, thanks, Gareth. So I guess, first of all, I, I guess if everyone's here, they're sort of interested in this topic and probably have your own thoughts and, about what eco-anxiety is, means. Um, but I guess just quickly to maybe set the scene a little bit, uh, eco-anxiety is this term that's popping up now more and more in the media. Um, it's been defined uh, in 2017 by the American Psychological Association as a chronic fear of environmental doom, but it's now really used as a term to cover a range of experiences that will be different for different people and might vary over time as well, but it encapsulates feelings of distress around uh, the facts um, of climate change and, and witnessing what's happening or being aware of what's happening. Um, and a whole range of emotions accompany that, understandably so, uh, when we think about the threat um, that is being faced and uh, the sort of implications of climate change now and into the future. And those emotions can include anger, guilt, um, fear, a grief, a loss. And so there's a wide range of understandable emotions people experience. And so we can talk about this more, but um, it's important we don't pathologize. So eco-anxiety is not seen as a new mental illness. Um, it's not something that needs to be sort of diagnosed in that sense. But it is still associated with um, understandable stress, and that has mental health implications for people. And we're seeing for some young people in particular, it can be quite overwhelming and um, you know, really affecting their daily life. A recent study found uh, of 10,000 young people around the world found that 45% reported that these feelings were impacting things like their sleep, their work, their relationships, their daily functioning. And so we both need to, uh, in, in terms of, like responding to it in terms of coping, coping with it, we need to both um, sort of hold that it's an understandable, natural, even healthy or empathetic response to what's going on. Um, and in some ways, you know, it, it's the people that are feeling eco-anxiety, uh, like the um, Caroline Hickman, a psychologist studying this uh, and working in this space as a clinician, says, you know, it's the people that have eco-anxiety in some ways are the ones responding uh, rationally to what's happening sort of mm -hmm. in the world. And so we don't want to pathologize it, but we do want to give people space to talk about it. We find that having it acknowledged um, as understandable uh, can be important for people to come together to talk about what, pe what people are experiencing, to allow space for that, but at the same time to uh, not have it be debilitating. Some of the things that we see are people being able to um, develop a sense of agency to respond to the challenges that we face or to start to see where there's hope and active hope in a way like um, seeing hope as a verb and working to do things that create that sense of hope um, within their own lives and within their communities um, and you know challenging bigger systems and we see that sort of both those things together both being able to find tools and resources um, and support um, that's appropriate to help people sit with what's going on um, and not sort of diminishing that or saying that you shouldn't be feeling this, but at the same time also helping people to move to a space where they can take action um, and sort of work towards the future world that we all want to see. That also seems to have big benefits for our mental health. And right. the collective actions we need to take as a society on climate change also have big mental health benefits, as I can um, talk to you later okay, as well. Okay, yeah. No, it's, it's, it's really good, even at this early stage, to get that combination of, mm -hmm. I suppose, hope and optimism versus the, you know, the, 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 the distressing elements and the anxiety that people feel. Um, Jennifer Uchendu joins us online. You'll be uh, seeing her on the screen over there. It's lovely to see you remotely, um, Jennifer. And um, you're sustainable development advocate, and you're also the founder of Susty Vibes. Susty Vibes. That's Susty Vibes. And you're a social enterprise, aren't you, uh, Jennifer? Just, just briefly tell me what you do. Thanks, Gareth, and hi, everyone. Good to see you again, Emma. 
Uh, my name is Jennifer Ochendu, and um, yes, I run an organization called Susti Vibes, which is a social enterprise, but really a youth-led platform for environmental projects in Nigeria, particularly working with young people. Yeah, in a nutshell. Okay, good. Thank you. Well, you're very welcome, Jennifer. And uh, also, our audience members online are very welcome to send in their questions onto this tablet computer here as well. I work for the BBC, so we never say iPad. You're meant to just say tablet computer, which makes you sound like your uncle, really, you know. But, it's, but anyway, um, <laughs> but it's right next to me, so this is a very good way of getting your um, voice into this um, discussion folks at home so just um, do send us something and don't rush them all in at the last minute like a lot of people tend to and make me panic so just feed me those questions just drip feed them during the panel I'd be very grateful indeed um, all right now also here we have um, uh, Lottie who um, I know has studied science communication yes. <laughs> <laughs> this is Lottie Dodwell um, welcome to the panel you're with the uh, Natural History Museum and could you introduce yeah. yourself further of course. So, um, hi everyone, I'm Lottie. Um, I'm an interpretation developer at the Natural History Museum, which probably doesn't mean that much <laughs> outside of a museum context. Um, but it basically means that I curate some of our exhibitions. And the most recent one that I worked on um, opened about a month ago now called Our Broken Planet. So I spent the last year, I mean, thinking about the climate crisis, probably longer in my life thinking about the climate crisis, but um, learning about what our audience want, what they know, and how we can actually get people through that kind of anxiety into action in a physical space and not just leave them with the, the doom and gloom that it's easy to sit in and, and rest in. So, yeah, yeah. that's me. Okay, so it's our broken planet, and it's on at the moment. It's on through September, isn't it? So um, It's on until next year, so... Oh, of course yeah, it is, you sorry, catch yeah. it till yeah. April next year. Yeah, so do go and see yeah. that, folks. Do, do people need to book tickets to get in at all? Is it? Um, we're still booking free tickets to get in. The exhibition is free. Um, the, we do do some walk-ins, but it's better to guarantee your slot by, by booking. Um, yeah. yeah, so okay. lots to see in the museum. All right. Um, and, and here in the theatre, I'll, I'll give you the opportunity. We'll get the discussion going for a bit. Yeah. Um, but what, once we're up and running, we'll, um, I'll, I'll invite you to pose questions. So you just come up to this uh, microphone and um, uh, pose your question, and that would be lovely. Um, so, um, so I think, Emma, you've done, already done a really good job of um, kind of really setting out what eco-anxiety is. Um, and a little bit about how we think about it from an academic point of view and I suppose from a, a practical point of view. But um, I wonder if you can sort of go a little bit further into that and, and maybe, and I know we, we shouldn't pathologise things too much, but you know, when we see, for instance, these distressing TV images, or worst of all, if we're actually caught up in extreme weather events and we might think they're down to climate change, I guess there must be feelings, you mentioned anger, distress, but a real feeling of helplessness, is that a big problem with dealing with eco-anxiety? A feeling of like, well, it's either, oh, there's nothing I can do about it, this is terrible, or even, well, there's nothing I can do about it, so I may as well fly to Benidorm every year and, you know, what the heck. So how does yeah. that play out? Yeah, for sure. So I think there's quite a few things um, to unpack there in, in what you just said. Mm -hmm. So, for, you know, to take that last part first, it's true that we, you know, everyone in the world, not just people feeling anxious about climate change, but everyone, when we see these stories, we all have a psychological, emotional response of, of some kind. And we hold different beliefs and, and narratives um, as individuals, but as a society about what this means. And some of those are more healthy or helpful than others, perhaps. Um, and, but we see, as you said, there's a sort of a range. You know, of course, some people feel really fatalistic, and that can be related to, yeah, this sort of narratives that, well, it, it's too late, we're kind of doomed, um, I may as well, you know, party on the ship that's going down um, kind of attitude. Or, you know, people feeling um, sort of denial and, you know, wanting to sort of block that off and push that to the back of their mind, and that's something that seems to be easier in some way for adults to do than for children and young people to do. Um, and so those kind of uh, defense mechanisms or sort of that cognitive dissonance or that ability to compartmentalize um, seems to be more prevalent maybe in um, older people than in children and, and younger adults, um, which is maybe why children and younger people are feeling and reporting more of these strong emotions that are more related to, oh my gosh, you know, there's this big threat that we're facing, what do we do about it? 
And, you know, but all of us um, can feel that, or we might feel a mix of different things from time to time. Um, and so it's, it's important, first of all, to help people understand, you know, what, the, the, what they are feeling now. And some, so just to sort of go back a step, I'm, um, as you said, at Imperial, and I'm part of a group called Climate Cares, and we're working um, to both understand and respond to the impacts climate change has on mental health, and that's from the perspective of research, design, policy, um, working with young people. And, um, you know, one of the things that we have found that's important is to create ways, um, and many others are doing this in, in great ways, to, for people to start to unpack and understand what's going on, but also understand the narratives that we're all told through these media stories and through, like, these, you know, code red for humanity headlines. You know, what is the narrative or what does that tap into within us? What, how are we responding to that? Um, and then how would we like to respond, um, I guess, and, and what vision of the future do we want to be working towards? And, you know, what's the role that we would like to take within that? as individuals um, and as a society. And you're completely right to go to your other point that it's basically there's a, there's a whole range of pathways by which climate change might impact mental health. One of them is what we're sort of talking about more to this point of this indirect experience or just being aware of what's happening, witnessing what's happening. Even maybe for someone like me um, as an Australian, I've seen, like, I've sort of witnessed the changes around my family's house. I've, seen the koalas like start to ask for water, which they never did. The summers have become, you know, super hot. It was never 47 degrees when I was a kid, and, you know, now it is in the summer sometimes. Mm -hmm. You know, there's bushfire smoke in my family's house um, now in the 2020 fires. So I've sort of witnessed these things, but I haven't been someone who's lost my house directly um, or, you know, feared for my life in a, in a flood or a fire um, or a hurricane. And yet, sadly, there's growing numbers of people around the world who are experiencing those direct effects or, you know, or droughts or forced migration or um, higher temperatures or any of these things. And all of that, understandably, has a big toll on mental health that we haven't really accounted for in policy and planning. So um, it's estimated, like in any form of disaster, 40 times the number of people will be affected psychologically as physically injured, which, you know, makes sense when you think about it. It's really stressful, it's really traumatic, it can have these long effects. But we usually report, you know, this many people sadly lost their lives, this many homes were destroyed, this was the total economic cost. We don't report on, you know, what was the impact, that further impact on communities um, psychologically, what was the sort of mental health support that needs to be built in yeah. to the response. Um, but this is starting to happen, and there's communities, you know, in the wake of these tragedies who've, uh, who've come together and have sort of created this response themselves. And so there's lots to learn from communities around the world, including groups like Jennifer's, um, who are starting to say, okay, you know, we're going to create a response to what's going on ourselves. Um, we're going to, you know, shift from this place of anxiety or helplessness into taking action. Um, but yeah, again, we're trying to um, sort of bring those together and provide support to, you know, to make sure that people can find that right support, yeah. um, you know, in, in whatever way that they're yeah. impacted. And, and, and then it almost sounds as if, you know, when the relief workers go in, and it's often about restoring infrastructure, for instance, or providing, you know, physical health, patching up people's broken bones and so on, and you sort of need that sort of mental health squad to be going in as well with the, the relief workers. But, but you did there mention um, Jennifer's work, and I did want to come to you, Jennifer, as well, because I know that you work, especially with a lot of young people, many of them, in, including yourself, just really seeing firsthand the effects of extreme climate events. And I wonder how much that how much eco-anxiety is part of your uh, conversation as part of the work that you do? Oh, I think Jennifer, Jennifer, you've frozen. Very I don't know if you heard the question, but yeah, she's... Let's, let's try and get Jennifer back, but I'm going to ask the, the audience here as well about your, your own perception of eco-anxiety. Um, and, um, and 
And I suppose, you know, you, you, I suppose you're entitled in a way to interpret eco-anxiety as you wish, you know, how much you, you worry about or are affected by climate change. So, so I think rather than saying hands up who worries about it, I think everyone's, most people will put their hands up. But so it's more like how many people would say that their worry verges on or is fully fledged eco-anxiety some of the time? Just now and again, you just you do get more than just a bit upset about it. You're stressed out and anxious. Yeah, me too. Um, I'm, okay, so hands up, and you can keep your hands up if you want to. You'd say who, has, who feels that anxiety actually a lot of the time, maybe even all the time. It's just always there when you wake up in the morning. Um, obviously not so much, but a few. Um, and don't beat yourselves up if, if you didn't put your hand up there, by the way, folks. It's just interesting to gauge from the room how people feel. Yeah. So, Lottie, maybe not surprisingly, there is, yeah. whatever you want to call it, eco-anxiety is present in the room, yeah. and we're not surprised by that. But yeah. I, I wonder how much that has informed your design and your team's design mm. of the exhibition, the Our Broken Planet exhibition at the Natural History Museum. Yeah, I mean, a huge amount, really, because we, we started a year ago thinking about we need to create this exhibition to talk about our relationship with the natural world. And of course that comes through all sorts of things. And we put an open call out to our scientists. They came back with about a hundred different ideas. Um, and fielding through them, many of them were quite depressing. <laughs> um, because as a natural history museum, we have an amazing collection of 80 million specimens. And we use a lot of those to do the kind of baselining of how things were, what's changing. And a lot of those things obviously are negative. Um, and so for us, kind of as exhibition curators, it was really interesting to think about our audience, do some research, even into Emma's research, on, on how many people are experiencing this eco-anxiety and how we can be sat as the Natural History Museum best to inform but help and be part of that discussion. Mm -hmm. um, there were some surprises along the way as well. I think we were all a little bit surprised when people came back and loved the title, Our Broken Planet. Because <laughs> um, we, we always do some audience testing for most of the things that we put in, in the museum. Um, and we had a few different ideas for what we might call this display. So um, something about our relationship with nature, or we need to talk about climate change. And Our Broken Planet was in there, but we were like, if that's too negative, nobody's going to want that. Um, and it came back really strongly as the one that people wanted to see. And I think it's really interesting that actually, like you've said, Emma, that some of what helps that eco-anxiety is actually recognising that it is a rational response to what's going on in the world. And then if we, if the Natural History Museum, are saying, yes, the planet is broken, we're, we've got into this horrible mix and we need to fix it, um, I think that's quite reassuring to some people in some ways. And then to find those solutions that we're working on and the ways that we're working together to fix it. But um, it was a surprise to kind of go through that journey of seeing how many people feel those things and also what's going to help. It's not kind of hiding those issues or brushing them under the carpet. It's being quite direct with yeah. them. But, but is there a kind of interpretive um, yeah. kind of conflict there in a way? Because mm. obviously you don't want the whole thing to be really depressing, but it needs, I mean, climate change is, is a massive issue and we yeah. can't <laughs> run away. You know, because otherwise you'd get loads of TripAdvisor reviews and Time Out reviews going, oh, it's so depressing. Don't go to the Natural History Museum. That's going to screw up your yeah. Saturday. Why, why would you do that? You know, it's, it's, <laughs> how, do you, how do you deal with that? <laughs> um, well, I think the same way that you deal with eco-anxiety, because we, we talked to lots of people at the beginning of... Um, of that experience about that kind of psycho psychological impact that thinking kind of existentially about the climate crisis has. So not thinking um, that you are somebody, you know, losing your home currently, but it's a bit of an existential thing that you know that you need to work on, you're a bit nervous about. Um, and talking to people, we, we found that it was actually, you can leave somebody within that kind of denial or that despair that we've spoken about, but actually you want that eco-anxiety to lead into action. So we never wanted to leave anybody coming out of the museum just with eco-anxiety. We want them to use that, that kind of anger or that passion or that grief, whatever it comes out as, and we all know that the best medicine for that is to move forward into action. So there was a point in discussion in, in our development where somebody kind of went, are we trying to get people eco-anxious? Is that a good outcome for this exhibition? That they've had that good rational response and they've come up with that? And we're like, ooh, I mean, good that they're kind of feeling that it's real and, and impacts them. But no, it's, it's then leading on to that action and getting into the mm. next step. So yeah. 
whether okay. that's scientific or something you can change mm. for yourself. I know, it's, especially because you know your, your audience is a very wide audience. Yes. You know, you imagine if you're seven years old, and you, you know, when I was seven, we went to the Natural History Museum and looked at Dippy and just you know, marvelled it. You know, yeah. and the idea that if I went to an exhibition at that age and they said, "Oh, everything's broken, it's all terrible," you know, I, I don't know, it might have messed me up a little bit. You know, I so, think it's, it's I, about I having choices. Yeah. yeah, so mm. it's, it's about having positive choices, and yeah. we've actually had a lot of quite young children in the exhibition. Recently, we had a, a five-year-old boy who came in, and we've got some science educators in the space who are doing kind of interactive um, things, thinking about the future of the food that we might eat. And so they were kind of saying to him, well, there's some problems with some of the food that we've got now, but we could all make really positive choices and making it about those positive future choices. Mm. Um, and he looked up to his mum and was like, do you think that we should have veggie burgers for dinner? <laughs> and they did. Awesome. <laughs> so I think it's yeah. taking those things as positive choices rather than the kind of, yeah, I don't want to make a seven-year-old cry. That's Yeah, yeah. no, fair play. Yeah. Yeah. Can, I just, um, Emma, can yeah. I just add to that as well? So I think it's, um, yeah. it is, you know, there, there is this spectrum as well, right, of, as you say, you know, you need people to, it's almost, yeah, like, you know, some level of, okay, we need to feel in response to this, we need to act in response to yeah. this, is important. I think there's also cases where people are feeling so overwhelmed and so distressed that it's becoming, um, you know, really problematic for, for their own health. And so that's where also, yeah. I guess, more professional support might be needed and there's sort of like climate aware psychologists now who are providing that kind of support. Yeah. But what a lot of them are saying, so I'm not a clinician, but talking to psychologists and other researchers, they and, and even teachers and parents, sometimes say that, you know, they until you start talking to your children about this, you might not be aware of what they're already holding. So it might not be that, you know, you're telling them something new, but yeah. there's a lot of kids who are already like holding this, who already know these kind of things, who already yeah. maybe know a lot more, or worried a lot more than we, um, we realize until yeah. we start actually having those conversations. And just having those kind of open discussions yeah. um, and acknowledging these things can be, um, really helpful yeah. and uh, we see as well that um, and anecdotally but then also this has been backed up now by this recent study of 10,000 young people that a big thing that is um, you know the cause of distress is not only what's happening with climate change but the lack of action in response and so it really um, you know if we can um, push for, for action at, at all levels um, that is a really important part of not only you know responding to climate change, but obviously the, our distress in the face of it would yeah. be different if we knew it was being addressed. Yeah. And um, so there's ways to be part of addressing that and also pushing for that that um, bigger change. But I think it's really important to acknowledge like that sense of children and young people saying, you know, we're being failed by by the older generations. We're being failed by people in positions of power, and that what like what that means to hold to hold that. Um, and kind of not shy away from what they're telling us and, and those facts. And I think that, um, you know, talking again to psychologists, they're sort of saying, well, you know, there is a lot that we can bring to support people through this, but also it's something, you know, this kind of existential threat of sort of our own making in a way is something that we haven't really faced in the same way before, yeah. like as a species in this sort of scale. Yeah. So it's also kind of... Um, learning as we go of, mm -hmm. of how we sort of think about and respond to this. But one thing that I found really helpful when you asked the question before of like raising your hand, I think I used to wake up like every day <laughs> feeling very overwhelmed um, by it. I think working in it has actually helped. Um, <laughs> finding other like-minded people talking about it, all these things that I'm saying helps actually helped me. But also, you know, things like I, you know, I remember listening to a talk by um, a journalist from the US, Emma Maris, who was talking about there never being a point where this kind of fatalism is okay, where we, it is actually hopeless, where we can just give up, because no matter where we go, like, there's always a better and a worse path forward, and climate change isn't this, like, black or white thing. It really is a, a case of there is always a better or worse path from wherever we're at, mm -hmm. and so I think it's both uh, recognising that there's losses and things to be to grieve, things to be angry about, but also things to still save, to still work towards. And 
that future we need for a safer climate actually really aligns yeah. with what we need for a healthier sure. future for us as well. Yeah. Yeah. So it's actually a really positive thing yeah. we can work towards. I mean, yeah, because like being negative and giving into it isn't going to solve climate change. So our only option is to have <laughs> optimism and, and hope and then a sense yeah. of action and, and, and so. But um, but Jennifer is back with us. And, and Jennifer, whilst you were away, you, you may have heard some of it, but um, we, we were talking there about young people, as you heard from Emma. And Lottie was talking about the challenge of programming um, a, a gallery in, in an exhibition in the Natural History Museum where they will have a hopefully a young audience amongst all their other visitors and this kind of tension between you know especially with a young audience wanting to convey a sense of alarm whilst at the same time not a sense of doom and, and hopelessness and um, you do a lot of work in your social enterprise with young people in Africa um, and very much affected every day by the realities of extreme um, climate and weather. Uh, so, so how does eco-anxiety factor into that conversation for you? Oh, that's a very good question, Gareth. I think for us in Nigeria, eco-anxiety had been a thing before it was named. I always say that it was something we, we grappled with. Um, we didn't have a name for it, but we knew that we were we're suddenly just being very anxious and overwhelmed, seeing that the problems were acute and life. Like they were literally things we were having to face and deal with, whether in our you know, direct environment or in other parts of Nigeria. And I think for us, conversations help. Having that platform and space to speak about this, I would have you know, young people say to me, don't you just get tired of the cycle of always going to clean up and the plastic just continues and you know, people are just not stopping, the problem persists. Or for example, in northern parts of Nigeria, we just keep hearing that desertification, persist, season in and out. It's like, don't you just get tired? And I guess conversations like that, people saying, you know, we're tired, we're scared, we're afraid. And in other parts of Nigeria, we even see anger, you know, anger playing out to say, governments have for so long known about, you know, the, the impact this could have on young people and their future and have just done little or nothing about it. So we see anger also playing out. So for us, when in 2020, I got to learn about eco-anxiety, it was almost like a light bulb moment. And I think it was also validating to hear that, you know, other young people were experiencing this kind of um, um, phenomenon, albeit in different ways, because I then sort of did dedicated time to research equal anxiety in young people living in England. And I saw, you know, differences where um, rather than guilt, which I saw, you know, young people in, in the UK experiencing, ours was anger and just overwhelmed, just feeling really powerless. Personally, I got to a stage where I just felt really powerless, you know, sitting at a climate change conference in Madrid, hearing all of the conversations and just not seeing what the next step is and how this, you know, translates to vulnerable communities who are actually suffering and just feeling really overwhelmed. Like, what can my voice do? And I guess that's how it plays out for us. Not having a name for it, now that eco-anxiety is now being talked about, it feels good to know that we can now put a voice and a name to this and we can still have the conversations. And just like Emma mentioned, space is critical. Having these networks and conversations around eco-anxiety, they do two things, really validate and then offer hope for solutions. So what can we do? Um, how do we increase conversations? Do we need to talk more around accountability? In Nigeria now, we're looking at more of talking about politics and how that impacts who the power holders are and how they will take environmental issues. So it's all encompassing and it starts from space. It starts from naming and defining and having a narrative about these feelings because they are real and they are valid. And um, obviously, we don't, I don't see it so much as a problem because for me, eco-anxiety, um, sort of identifying one other eco-anxious person is saying, oh yeah, we feel the same thing. We're gonna do something about this. This is valid. I can hold your hand together you know, with empathy and we can actually walk towards um, finding solutions, not just for ourselves, but also for our future, uh, basically. 
Okay, yeah, so that, that positivity, so breaking out from that, you know, just identify, yes, this is eco-anxiety. Now we have a name for the way that we feel that encapsulates our anger um, and our distress and our anxiety, and that, that's all part of, of moving forward. Um, yeah. Now, let, let's just see here in, in London if there are any questions from the audience. I bet there are on this one. Yes, I can see a hand up over there if you want to. Two so if I, I'll, I'll take you on the left-hand side because we ran out of time for you in the last panel. So you, you have the moral authority to come to the microphone. Um, and if you want to, you can say your name and introduce yourself. It's just up here, um, but uh, let's just hear your question. Oh, I think the mic's off, actually. One more time. It'll be... Uh, yeah, just, just try giving a little tap. They've probably faded it up by now. Um, I don't think we... We can. Well, I'll tell you, if you just oh, say the question. Oh, I heard yeah. a boom. Let's try again. Um, no. Oh, see if you can switch it on. That's, you're doing hear. sound engineering at the front here. Um, no no worries at all. Why don't you just say, say the question, and then I'll, I'll, I'll repeat it so the online people can hear it. Did you, is it Alex? Did you say your name? Alex, yeah. Yes, Alex. Nice to meet you, Alex. So what's your question? You <laughs> um, so uh, I guess what do you guys make of fossil fuel sponsorship of museums? Oh. Right, curveball coming in there from Alex. Um, so the, the question from Alex is, um, what do you have to say about um, sponsorship coming in from museums? You're entitled to say no comment, Lottie, if you want, but um, yeah. <laughs> um, I'll say that we don't have any fossil fuel sponsorship for the Natural History Museum. Um, so I think it's a, a really, really tough issue. Um, and I know lots of other museums are also facing it. And it does mean that with funding cuts that we are you know, turning down money to do what we do but I think um, you know through all kinds of things we want to be doing the, you know leading the way as the Natural History Museum and doing the right things and we found people coming up to people in our cafes and being like why are you still selling tuna or why is, and it's great it's great to have those questions probably not for our waiting staff but mm -hmm. um I think it's good that we're that we're putting those questions there because they yeah. need to be answered. No, yeah. absolutely. Yeah, you know, because on, on the, the programme that I, I work on, the, the BBC programme, we were invited to um, a gallery launch at a completely different museum. Yeah. Yeah. And um, we were really looking, looking forward to it and then noticed who the sponsor was, the oil company. We just said, yeah. we're not doing it, we're not covering this. No yeah. way. Yeah. Yeah. And we might have actually, you know, that might not have been the best way forward because, as you say, you know, museums, you know how desperate the funding situation is in really museums. Is. And it especially after yeah. the year and a half we've yeah. just had, you know, yeah. do, do you take the money and then and use yeah. that to communicate important messages about climate yeah. change? It's a really difficult one. It's not really what this panel is about, but I'm really glad you raised it, though, Alex. Yeah. I mean, it, it'd be the elephant in the room otherwise, yeah. wouldn't it? Yeah. Um, well, well, just because I want to get some, through some audience questions, hold that thought, Emma, and let, let's go to you. And I remember you from what, come, come to the microphone. Because um, you're an, an air quality researcher, aren't you, if I remember oh, rightly? Cool. Yes, yeah. Precious pack included a leaflet from HSBC to start a, a student account. What message does this send to the young people starting this year, and how do we turn that around? And I've got a follow up for Lottie. Um, the uh, Natural History Museum Broken Planet solutions are not governmental but individual. Might this exacerbate guilt and anxiety? And uh, like the Natural History Museum, we need to start to engage in more impactful solutions that require government action mm -hmm. rather than staying politically neutral. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, so two questions there. Um, so, uh, so for the audience at home, one of the, the first one was about the Freshers Pack at Imperial College that has a you know, HSBC bank is, is part of, is mentioned in there. Um, and, uh, and and I'm trying to make this an eco because I'm trying to get it back on topic, and I can see an eco-anxiety um, sort of angle to it, that the, when the Freshers Pack, Emma, um, has all kinds of um, branding and, 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 and um, mentions of big brands from, um, I don't know if there are oil companies in there, but you mentioned there are some sort of quite big sort of commercial interests 
present in the freshest pack. And maybe the eco-anxiety question might be, so you're a young person signing on at Imperial and the first thing you get is a whole load of branding and you've gone to Imperial partly because you want to be part of the fight against climate yeah. change and you're confronted with all kinds of interests. And maybe what you're confronted with is, is the reality of society, that it's, that, mm. that it's a big commercial world out there and yeah. the commercial world and academia rub up together, often for good, sometimes for not so good. And where the heck does that lead to climate? And isn't that stressful for young graduates coming in? Yeah, so thank you for the question. I think it's a great question. I have to say, in terms of um, funding from, you know, for fossil fuels into a whole range of situations, whether it's our personal superannuation, our, like the banks that we use, all sorts of systems that we, that we use in places we work for, places we frequent. It's obviously a, a really big and important topic. And I know that there's been a lot of push for one of the things that we can do as individuals is to divest and to try and um, put our sort of spending power into things that aren't related to um, uh, fossil fuel consumption. Um, but, you know, I, I, I have to say, I, I can't really comment on um, Imperial's um, spending, partly because I have nothing to do with it um, personally, so I, I don't have sort of impact over those decisions. But I also know that it's something that young people at Imperial and students have been raising, and students in other universities have been raising and putting pressure on different universities and different systems within our society, of course, to, to take up this challenge of, you know, how do we move towards um, a, lower, a lower carbon world? Um, and so I think it's, you know, these tensions are really important, both between our, you know, the individual um, messaging narratives we get, what is on the individual versus what is on, on the system. And I think that, that that tension is challenging as it relates to eco-anxiety, in the sense of these messages that um, uh, Jennifer mentioned before in her research with young people in the UK, guilt was something that came up a lot. And in our research with young people in the UK last year, we surveyed over 500 young people in 2020 about COVID and climate. And they reported higher distress around climate than around COVID, even though COVID was having a much bigger impact on their daily life. And we looked at the different patterns of emotions that they felt. And while COVID was more associated with things like isolation and disconnection, climate was more associated with um, anger and guilt um, and anxiety. And so this sense of guilt, though, was interesting because um, they also reported feeling less, like, that they didn't um, sort of less uh, awareness of what they could do in response or also not sure for many people of like what how their actions could make a difference so there's this both this tension of like i'm too small to make a difference as a narrative but also like all of my choices have this big impact on the planet so and i you know i've got to feel guilty about it so how do you know those narratives are both in our society like how do you you know how do you hold both of those what impact do they have and what um what is our role as individuals in making those changes in our daily life, but also, you know, being part of, of changing the system or moving towards, you know, what kind of systems do we want to live in? You know, what does that world look like? How do we all work towards making that happen? And I think that it is important to, particularly for young people, to be aware that it's, you know, it's not all on one person's shoulders. It's not all up to them to, you know, save the world, but that we all do have some agency to contribute towards mm. making these changes. Um, and that, you know, that we can start to think about what that future world looks like that we want, what systems are they that we want to be um, supporting and putting our money behind and all of those kind of decisions then. Mm. But I, I think, again, there's a lot more I could say, and particularly if you're into air pollution research, that you know things like if we have burn foss less fossil fuels, you have lower air pollution. Um, poorer communities are more affected by that. It affects their physical health. It affects their mental health. Um, rates of schizophrenia and anxiety and depression are higher where there's higher air pollution. So, mm -hmm. if we create this kind of cleaner world, not only is it helping the safer climate, it's also helping more equal societies, mm -hmm. a healthier future. So. We can start to think about that. Yeah, great. I mean, yeah, lots of themes tied up there. So, so the other aspect of, of the question was to you, Lottie, which was this um, this focus at the Our Broken Planet um, um, exhibition 
on the individual and maybe not so much uh, about you know, policy organisations and governments? Um, yeah, I'd, I'd say I slightly disagree with that because <laughs> um, we, we did think really carefully in pulling this together that we don't just want to give individual actions. Um, it's really important to have those, partly because that's actually what people want when they come into the museum. One of the things that we constantly get as feedback is that they kind of want to know what they can do and that's why we have so many different actions um, available on our website that you can look at. But I think actually a lot of people do know what those actions are. So we were really careful that we looked at some of the things that you can do as an individual and some of the things that we want governments and companies to do. Um, and just some of the examples are um, in, in the exhibition, we've got a huge display of plastic from the Thames and it's all big brands. It's, oh, we've got, um, it's all really big brands, um, and I was part of that cleanup going down to the Wet Wipe Reef in Barnes, which is a part of the Thames that has completely changed shape because of plastic. Yeah, because it's clogged um, up with wet wipes. Yeah, it's yeah, it's spongy when you, you're on it. It's horrible. Um, but we, in, in a film there with um, one of our plastic scientists, Alex McGorin, and the activist Malati Wisen from Bye Bye Plastic Bags, we were calling on governments and companies to make changes um, and to, that it's not on individuals. We can't really just take plastic out of our lives in quite natural ways or there, there are always barriers to doing those things. So yeah, that's just one example, but there were so many in, in that exhibition that we were looking at forestry management, we were looking at the supply of um, lithium for green technologies like, um, like cars, that are electric cars that we need for the future. Um, we also focused on the UK carbon budget um, which shows all of the different actions that the UK is going to need to take as a government by 2050 to get to net zero. Um, so, yeah, if you'd like to come for a tour, I'd be happy to show you around and, and show you those, those solutions that, that we want to see. But, yeah. We'll get, but I, we'll get that yeah. set up. Great stuff, Lottie. Yeah, thank you. Um, so, um, so this, this, just a quick reply on this. This is, comes in from uh, Mariah Kerr, then we'll, we'll go back to Jennifer. Um, and a question from the audience as well. So we've got lots of work to do over the next 14 minutes. My goodness, <laughs> okay, it's gonna get busy. <laughs> yeah, good stuff, keep, keep the pace going. Um, so, uh, 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 Marika asks um, in our um, online audience, would you say mindfulness could be helpful in dealing with eco-anxiety? And Emma, you've already told us you're not um, like a mental health practitioner. Mm -hmm. So you're, I don't know, do, do you have any comments on that or is that just not your field? Uh. Well, a bit of both, really. I, yeah, as I said, I'm not um, sort of can't give kind of clinical perspective or advice, but you know, I think we see anecdotally in talking to young people and in mental health in general, you know, different things work for different people, and you know, it, partly, yeah, it's about finding these tools mm -hmm. to be able to sit with what we're feeling and, and process mm -hmm. what we're feeling, and of course, mindfulness is quite well known for for helping people to to do that, to be, to, to be able to um, kind of be more present and more aware of, of what they're kind of processing. So in that sense, um, I think for some people it is helpful, but yeah, I think different things work for different people. Okay, that's great. And just, just out here in the, um, I keep wanting to say the studio audience, I'm so BBC, <laughs> aren't I? Um, in our <laughs> theatre audience, um, out of those of you who had your hands up before about that you, you have some, e e what you might call eco-anxiety, um, how many of you practice mindfulness as a way of coping with that anxiety. Yeah, quite a few of you. So for the people at home, that's about the same number of people who said they had eco-anxiety who put their hands up about the mindfulness aspect as well. So that's really interesting. Um, so, um, so before we come to you, audience member John, I just do want to get you, whilst we have you, Jennifer, either you're back with us, and this is excellent. And in our last part of our conversation, Jennifer, um, you were, you were talking really about the young people that you work with, um, and you're a young person yourself, who you spoke a lot about the anger that is felt, and this kind of real sense that, you know, this danger in a way that younger people in Nigeria may be feeling, oh, all these people in Madrid are talking about climate change, but we're here, the, you know, we're the ones dealing with the brunt of it. Mm -hmm. um, and that's, I thought that was very powerful when you said that. But what about also the Africa and Nigeria? You know, you have a, a, a young population, you know, in the so-called global north. We have aging populations. The future is literally in your hands in, in Africa, in, in Nigeria. 
What, does, is there a ripple of excitement and positivity that might be combating some of that eco-anxiety? Is that empowering or not for you, from your perspective? Hmm, that's a very interesting question. And sometimes it borders on this, um, this responsibility and burden of hope that's often placed on young people. We get phrases like, it's your time to change the world. The future is in your hands. But we know that in reality, the future really is in the hands of decision makers and power holders. And whatever we see here today come as a result of decisions that have been made you know, years, years back. So the future really is not really in our hands because we don't make a lot of these decisions. What we've seen in terms of our numbers and what we can do with that is that we can take a stand a stand for climate action, a stand for the environment, and we can you know, put a foot forward to say in our shopping decisions, in our conversations, we're going to sound the light and put this, put these conversations out to say, we really, really want climate action and we want it now. However, there's a thin line with how far reaching that can be. There's been a couple of protests you know, in Nigeria around insecurity and other issues we faced. And we, we really saw how power holders really sort of strifled that effort, you know, because you have the army, the police, all working for the government, and that can be really frustrating. So I try to move away from that narrative that, you know, we have the power because of our numbers, because we, that doesn't always play out. However, there's the power of, you know, social media as, um, as where we have access to it. There's where we can put our voices out and let the world know that this is our stand. There's the action we can take locally, you know, tree planting, lots of community engagement and participation, lots of advocacy, which is what we're doing in Susti Vibes, making sure that people are aware of the problems that they're facing. But really, we know that it's not enough. We still need that government action. We still need investments and divestments from, you know, fossil fuel and whatnot. We still need to put money where, you know, our mouths are in terms of where the conversation really should be driving and so it's often it's good to have the balanced conversation to say we know what we need to do we're pushing but it's really hard it's not easy and I guess that's what adds to the eco anxiety that feeling of helplessness to say we know what we should be doing but why, why isn't the world moving as quickly as it should why do we you know keep grappling with the news and all of the climate disasters that we see happening to us every other day so that's the reality of where we are unfortunately yeah no I, I get it and, and just a quick one on this but I, I just wonder you know, how um, how high how, how highly eco-anxiety rates on the list of other anxieties faced by young people in Nigeria. And we'll be here, for instance, a huge problem with kidnapping. It's basically an industry in Nigeria and in, econ in an economy which is so propped up by fossil fuels as well. Um, so many other things for young people in Nigeria to worry about. How highly does eco-anxiety rate? So we know that the more, the more informed young people are, the more exposed they are to the news and to everyday climate disaster stories, the more, um, the more likely they are to sort of be aware of the eco-anxiety they face. What I'm realizing is until you have the conversation and, you know, a young person say, oh, yes, I've thought about this. You know, I see the problem. I see how this affects food food security. I see how this can impact security in Nigeria. And it's really not just, we don't see this as a weather problem or just an environmental problem. It is a social problem. It's a food problem. You know, it's, it's a reproductive health problem. It's, you know, it's a gender problem. And it goes through and through. So I, I think it's for us, it's seeing climate change as how it impacts our world, how everything is changing um, really as the climate is changing and how inaction can really impact what our future will look like in 5, 10, 15 years. And that's how it plays out for us in Nigeria. Um, of course, when we look at it side by side with other 
sustainable development problems. You know, there's poverty, there's unemployment, you know, there's, um, there's hunger to deal with. But when you see how climate change impacts all of these other issues and you are aware and informed, it gets really scary. And that's where the eco-anxiety comes out a lot. Yeah, so you see it with the climate aware, the climate activists, the environmental, you know, enthusiasts in Nigeria who already know about the interrelationships between climate change and these other issues. Okay, um, great. Well, we've got five minutes to go. Time to squeeze in at least one question. And it is John, isn't it? And I probably no need to come up to the mic, actually. I'll just repeat your question. So what do you have? Yeah. Okay. And for those of you, those of you at home, John was just sort of saying there's a, a, an issue here about the mainstream media and the newsworthiness, I suppose, of um, climate-related um, events and the uh, natural. Seems ironic to call them natural disasters, but we all know what we mean. But um, but to paraphrase John's question, that um, the uh, mainstream media is always portraying the awful sides of climate change um, with news footage of terrible disasters. Um, you know, so how responsible is the media for feeding into eco anxiety? And uh, we well, we have a question over there as well. So then we'll probably I'll find a clever way of putting them both to the panel and still finishing on time. So just to shout your question out from over there. Okay. Yeah. All right. Um, so, so just to, to sum it up, I'm going to say it's a question of, of narrative. I said says one of our speakers much more eluquently than me in, 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 over in the back there for the, our people at home. So I just need really quick responses from, um, from our science communication people here, both of you, yeah. um, just to that point about the media and the narrative. Uh, think, Lottie. Yeah. yeah, I think it is a real challenge. And it was probably you, Gareth, who told mm -hmm. me about kind of why things are made newsworthy and that kind of news cycle that is is really challenging to cut through. Um, I'd say one thing that's really impressed me through the last year has been connecting with so many young activists around the world and they're, you know, they're kind of really like making their own um, their own space and I think young people are curating that narrative whether it's through Instagram or through TikTok or whatever to find that positivity and I, I hope that there are more people who are doing that and clinging on to that, whether it's kind of understanding the issues or understanding actions or things that they need to take or protest or whatever it is. So that's my kind of like, yeah, get through yeah. the system. Yeah. So, so in the round, but, the, the yeah. number of messages meeting people yeah. um, are not just the really negative ones. But I mean, John's point I is very well made that yeah, we can't is, deny yeah. awful headline news has a massive yeah. impact and it takes a lot of other narratives and conversation yeah. to counteract yeah. that. But it's a, I know I can see a hand. See, I knew this had happened. We'd get a big rush of questions oh, yeah. just before the end. <laughs> yeah. um, we've got a minute to go. Right. Uh, so quick, final comment from you, Emma. Yeah, I'll just quickly respond to that question because I, I, I think... Your point is right, the facts of climate change are alarming, are yeah. just inherently distressing and need to be um, conveyed. But 
I think when we talk about narrative, it's also about what are we being told that we should be doing in response or who's responsible, yeah. um, you know, how much hope is there mm. for the future, you know, all of these kind of things that go around those facts and our response to them. Yeah. Um, and we're working at the moment with the Natural Environment Research Council and a group of other partners and Force of Nature is a group of young people and Common Vision mm -hmm. to help young people explore those responses but also hear about the good yeah. work being done. And so I do yeah. think it's important to highlight that this kind of active hope in this process of um, you know, making that more hopeful future through our actions, even, you know, while holding that, you know, these are very alarming, distressing facts that we have to see kind of clearly and then help people, like, hold that um, response. But I do agree that, like, having, you know, if when people are overwhelmed and don't know what to do um, or also hear these kind of greenwashing narratives of, well, it's all about your individual carbon footprint and not about, like, us, you know, yeah. changing anything within the bigger system, you know, that's obviously problematic. At the same time, you know, people need to see their, um, you know, the actions that they can take yeah. as individuals. So I think it's it's balancing those things, um, and that's what I meant by narratives, I guess, right. if that helps. Okay, that, that really does help, Emma. And there you go. Would you look at the time? It's now, it's closing time on this discussion. <laughs> um, so just before I thank everybody, um, one thing, when we have properly finished, we need you to leave quite quickly. We're not being horrible or antisocial, but they need to wipe things down, let the aerosol settle, and then we've got another panel coming in in half an hour, so we are going to have to ask you to leave. But before that, that um, before we um, uh, say, say farewell, just a feedback from you would be lovely, if you don't mind. Um, so we're going to put... Uh, up on the screen in a minute a url you can go to or the qr code but honestly feedback really helps us we're already thinking about planning next year's events and we'll roll in your feedback um, and fix probably like i didn't get my question in you know <laughs> fair enough you know i should have given you more time so all those kinds of things just let us know um, what else do i need to tell you and at home by the way you've got um, a link coming up in your chat right now at home so you can give us your feedback and you might win a 50 pound voucher so that's not bad for just sitting at home watching a discussion is it so um so that's all good and um and of course this is part of the one world series of talks and events um keep an eye on the great exhibition road great great exhibition road festival.co.uk website for everything that's going on it's not just today don't just go home and forget about it we have a load of talks and events and online stuff as well going right up in the the week ahead so um do those support those we really appreciate appreciate you being here huge thanks to um jennifer over there in nigeria and uh, and also to lossie and emma on stage here um i'm gareth mitchell and also saying obviously the biggest thanks is to all of you online and here in the hall for coming and supporting this event and have a wonderful day. Take care. Bye-bye. <laughs>